Okay, Luke, uh, another week, uh, another video. Um, still in lockdown, still socially distant. Mm -hmm. uh, at least it's sunny outside. It is. Um, but I see that you've got a nature paper. I saw that on Twitter. I, uh, I haven't read it, but given that I can just talk to you, why don't you uh, save me the trouble? Oh, ah, okay. What that's was right. it about? Okay, so uh, that's correct. Uh, we had a nature paper yesterday. When I say we, what I mean is uh, a paper was led by my uh, PhD student, uh, Zhen Wan. And this is a paper from a big international collaboration, which is the the Southern Stellar Stream Spectroscopic Survey, which is S5 for short, which involves astronomers nice. in, in Australia, uh, in North America, and in Europe. And of course, m maybe not everybody who listens to this would understand why you know, having a paper in Nature is such a big thing. So It is a, it is a big deal. Uh, yeah. So Nature is, is one of the sort of premier basically science journals, it's not, not just astronomy journals, but for all of science, it started late 1800s, I think, mid 1800s, who knows. But uh, so getting a nature paper, everyone knows what that means. It means you had a, a, a result that it was important enough to go into this prestigious journal with a whole bunch of other, so, so reading through nature is a very weird experience actually, because there's, there's the astronomy paper and then there's something about genetics and then there's a, a major result from geology or something. And, so yeah, right. it's, it's, a, it's a big deal. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, so le let me just give you the background. Uh, there, there's an experiment going on, uh, run by a big collaboration in the US called the Dark Energy Survey. Mm -hmm. And the Dark Energy Survey uh, is using a four meter telescope in Chile. And it has this beautiful, uh, very, very sensitive camera on it for taking deep Im images of the sky. Mm -hmm. And this project, as the name suggests, want to try and work out what dark energy is, right? So we know that dark energy is this stuff which is accelerating the expansion of the universe. Mm -hmm. Don't know what it is, right? And we point out that this is a, a big mystery, right? In our, yep. in our first book. So the dark energy survey is mapping out the locations of galaxies and it's looking for distant supernova. And it's, it's basically trying to do all those kind of cosmological tests to, to work out, can we get a handle on dark energy? Mm -hmm. Now, of course, They've got a camera, so they get images. So you get a certain amount of information from images, mm -hmm. but also what you want is spectroscopy. You want to be able to take the light from distant sources, disperse it through a prism, or it's a gr grism, a great in prism is what we use. Disperse the light and look at the spectra because that tells you things like, especially in cosmology, the redshift, mm -hmm. and also other details about galaxies. Are they forming stars? Are they full of old stars? all that kind of cool stuff right so here in australia we have uh, our own telescope it's the 3.9 meter anglo-australian telescope located at coonabarabran which is, is in is it still called the anglo-australian telescope it, it's it is a, a teeny bit of history here so the the telescope was uh essentially the brainchild or you know it fred hoyle that astronomer whose name keeps popping up Mm -hmm. He was one of these that pushed this uh, joint project between Britain and Australia to build a telescope. So they built a telescope called the Anglo-Australian Telescope, and it was run by the Anglo-Australian Observatory. Mm -hmm. Now, about a decade ago, uh, Britain pulled out of that project. So having the Anglo-Australian Observatory seemed a bit weird, and its name changed to the Australian Astronomical Observatory. Mm -hmm. So it kept the name AAO, but the telescope kept the name Anglo-Australian Telescope. Oh, okay. Yes. I wasn't actually clear on that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Right. yeah, yeah. So Carry the, on. The history, et cetera. Anyway, it's an old telescope. It was built, I think it was uh, finished in 1974. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, it's been around for quite a while. And it has always stayed at the cutting edge, not because it's a four meter telescope, they, they are dime a dozen, not because of its location, right? It's on a very low mountain in central New South Wales, surrounded by trees and forests. The weather that's, conditions. That's all we have in Australia. <laughs> yeah, out. yeah, yeah. But what the uh, Anglo Australian Telescope has always excelled in is its instruments. Mm -hmm. So it's not like a bog standard telescope with just one kind of camera at the end, etc. It has a suite uh, of instruments, and over the years, it's had an evolving suite of instruments. Mm -hmm. And one of the most powerful has been this robot called 2DF. 
-hmm. So what you've got is at the top of the telescope, you've got the mirror right here, top of the telescope at the top end, you have this device, which is essentially a pair of metal plates and a robot that can put optical fibers at particular places on those metal plates. So there's a robot that positions these fibers. You rotate the thing around, so it points at the mirror, and you can collect the light from individual objects on the sky. And so 2DF uh, can have 400 fibers, so you can collect the light from 400 objects. Mm -hmm. And the important thing is that the 2DF means two degree field. So it's a two degree field of view, which is a big chunk of sky, which nicely matches the field of view of this dark energy camera mm -hmm. on the telescope in Chile. So in Australia, we've had this project running whereby they do deep imaging of the sky, we take spec spectra, and we work together. So there's been a big project called AusDES, Australian Dark Energy Survey, nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which has been getting spectra of galaxies, supernova, quasars, etc. Mm -hmm. Now, when you take a camera and you point it out into the universe, you know, you might be looking for the most distant object, but you do have to look through the nearby stuff. Yeah. Right. You can't avoid the nearby stuff. And for us, the nearby stuff are stars in our own galaxy and especially in the stellar halo that surrounds the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that the dark energy survey has done is it's imaged a big chunk of sky looking for all this different stuff at cosmological distances, mm -hmm. but also captured lots and lots of stars in our galactic halo. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you can see is that it isn't just a smooth distribution of stars, but there are lumps and streams and stuff, just debris mm -hmm. in the halo of the Milky Way galaxy. So we think that the Milky Way has grown over time through accreting smaller objects. And what happens is you take a dwarf galaxy, which might have a billion stars, it falls in and the gravitational tidal fields pull on that dwarf and stretch it and stretch it and stretch it until it becomes a stream. And then that stream basically becomes dispersed completely and the stars join the overall stars in the halo of the Milky Way. Right. This is... Uh, according to the current theory, this is actually one of the standard ways that that uh, galaxies grow. So yes. we, we we sort of going back to the 60s and 70s, we weren't sure whether a great big lump of stuff collapsed into a big galaxy with some, some smaller galaxies around it, or whether smaller galaxies formed and then grew into big galaxies piece by piece. And we now think it's the second of yes. those. So this is, a, this is not just something that you know, might happen from time to time in the universe. Actually, you know, big, big galaxy eats smaller galaxy is one of the major galaxy forming processes. Absolutely. And um, some of the first big evidence for this uh, came from the early 1990s, work done by, uh, he was a fellow PhD student in Cambridge at the time with me, uh, Rodrigo Abata, who's now at the uh, uh, observatory in Strasbourg. And he actually discovered a dwarf galaxy, uh, which is in the constellation of Sagittarius. It's huge on the sky, many, many times larger than the full moon. But it is really stretched out and really dispersed. The, the distribution of stars is really hard to pick out on the sky. Well, almost impossible with your eye, but if you, if you can um, stack your data, et cetera, you can pick out this thing. And that is direct evidence that the Milky Way is eating other galaxies right now. Mm -hmm. Sagittarius is stretched and we now know that its stars essentially wrap the entire galaxy so go right across the sky and in a few billion years a few more orbits there will be no more Sagittarius. Mm -hmm. What they saw in the DES fields is that they found an entire collection of streams right so there's a whole bunch of streams at different distances from uh, the earth mm -hmm. and those streams are ongoing feeding events the Milky Way is feeding, pulling these things apart. So we want to study those streams for two reasons. Number one is that they will tell us how the Milky Way has been feeding. Mm -hmm. right? How many dwarf galaxies has it eaten over the last billion years, the last five billion years, etc. Yeah. Because you could tie that directly into your cosmological theories of how the entire yeah. universe is. Right? So that's a cool thing. But the other thing, which is the thing that interests me, is if you measure the speeds of the stars, and you can work out their orbits, 
the orbit of a dwarf galaxy as it's being disrupted depends upon the stars that we can see and all of the dark matter we can't. Mm -hmm. So the streams, if you can measure their orbits, will be a measure of what the dark matter distribution is doing in the Milky Way. Right? Now, one of the interesting things which people may not know is we know that there is a lot of dark matter out there, but we don't know how it's distributed. We don't know what shape the dark matter halo of the Milky Way is. Mm -hmm. Our cosmological simulations that we can do in supercomputers suggest that it should be a sort of squashed distribution, yeah. right? So it should be flattened. Various tests we've done so far have said, oh, it could be squashed, or it could be extended like a rugby ball, or it could even be spherical. So we, right. we, don't, we don't really know what the shape of the dark matter halo of the Milky Way is. So that we have a project, the S5, where we're measuring the speeds of stars and the chemistry of stars to try and piece together the accretion history and measure the amount of dark matter there is in the halo of the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. that's, that's the background. That's the background. So yeah. what, it, what is the Phoenix stream? Okay. They all have cool names. They're like the Monocera stream, stream. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and in fact, uh, it's, uh, there's been a discovery over the last few years, the number of streams discovered has gone up rapidly and people are choosing different origins for the name. So if it's in a con particular constellation, you sometimes choose the constellation name, but mm -hmm. other people are taking characters from that, you know, Greek and Roman sort of mythology, that's done. Grab some, <laughs> grab some Norse mythology, grab some Hawaiian mythology and use yeah. the names from there, right? So, so the names are multiplying, but Phoenix is relatively boring. It's in the Phoenix constellation on the sky. That's not too bad. Yeah, yeah. So it's a stream and uh, it was discovered a few years ago and we decided we would take observations of this stream as part of S5. So it's a pretty interesting stream. It, firstly, that it's, as far as we can see on the sky, it's about eight degrees long, which is about 16 times the diameter of the full moon. Yeah. Right? The so moon's about half a degree. Just, yeah. just everyone remember that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, so if you, it's, it's a, the stream is located at around 67,000 light years. All right. Mm -hmm. It's about 27,000 light years long. It's about 150 light years across. Well, right. So it's very skinny. It's really thin. Yeah, yeah. very, very, to, very thin. To give a rough sort of scale here, the distance from uh, Earth to the center of our galaxy is sort of 25,000. Uh, light years. Yes. So those are the sort of size of the galaxy scales that we're dealing with. So yes. yeah, this thing is big. Yeah, yeah. So thin, really and, thin. And really thin. So it's a really thin stream, which tells you that firstly, you know, it doesn't have long left to, to go, right? I mean, it's already <laughs> been dispersed and a few more orbits, it'll be gone. The fact that it is very thin, and also we measured the velocities of the stars, the stars are wibbling around at very low speeds of a couple of kilometers per second at most, right? A couple of kilometers per second sounds fast, mm. um, but for a, a, an object orbiting, that's actually very slow. Mm -hmm. So what we deduced is that this stream isn't a, um, a dwarf galaxy that's being stretched out. It's actually a globular cluster. Oh, right. So, all right. What's what's a globular? Well, let me let me just take a crack at that. What's the difference between a dwarf galaxy and a globular cluster? The short story is sometimes we see lots of stars in a little area, it, but not on a galaxy scale within a galaxy or around a galaxy. Sometimes we say it's a dwarf galaxy. Sometimes we say it's a globular cluster. The difference is uh, is most of the mass that we see in, in the case of a globular cluster, basically all the mass that we see for this collection of stars seems to be in the stars themselves. They can, the stars themselves can hold the thing together given how fast everything's moving. Yeah. So it's not, it's it, it, the overall structure of how the stars are moving is basically random. It's just a swarm for some reason in our galaxy, uh, somewhere between sort of a thousand to maybe a hundred thousand stars just decide to get together and swarm around each other in a little bunch. That, and we that's call right. that a globular cluster. Yes. With a dwarf galaxy, 
it would need dark uh, matter to hold it together. Correct. So, so this is, oh, it's a stream form from a globular cluster. That's right. And so globular clusters can, can get up to about a million stars. Okay. And there are about 150 of these objects in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. And as you, as you said, it, they don't look like they've got any dark matter. So exactly how you make a globular cluster is not straightforward, right? Because yeah. you've got to, got to get gas to go thump and make a million stars and they all hold together. Whereas typically what happens, like in a dwarf galaxy, gas pools into the dark matter, which provides a, a, a site where yeah. the gas can cool and then you form stars inside there. So, right. okay, so who cares then, right? The Milky Way <laughs> already has around 150 globular clusters. Andromeda next door has over 400, mm -hmm. right? They're qu quite common. Now we think some of the globular clusters formed in the Milky Way. Now, I should point out, globular clusters tend to be old, right? Yes. 10 to 12 to 13 billion years old. Yeah. Okay, so some of the oldest objects in, that we know in the universe. We think some formed in the Milky Way itself. Mm -hmm. Others formed in other galaxies that fell in, mm -hmm. right? So some are, are native, some are immigrants. And exactly mm -hmm. what that mix is, people are trying to work out. Now, one of the cool things about globular clusters is that when, when we take a spectrum of the stars in a globular cluster, we can measure its chemical makeup. Yeah. Okay. So now we need to do a little bit of history of the universe. All right. Sure. So let's, I'm going to test you, right? Universe was born, nuclear synthesis. What came out of nuclear synthesis? What was the mix of elements? Hydrogen, helium, and a little bit of lithium. Yeah. That's about so, it. So you create the first stars yeah. and they're purely hydrogen and helium, but in their cores, they make heavier elements. Yeah. The stars die, elements get spat out, recycled into the next generation of stars. Yep. Right? We think that uh, because hydrogen and helium don't, they, they don't uh, cool off very efficiently, they won't collapse down very efficiently. So the first generation of stars are probably big and short lived and blow up pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah, which as astronomers, we call those population three. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is just another, just another stupid leftover bit of, anyway, I'll, anyway we'll, we'll, we'll rant about that some other time. We will. Okay, so um, subsequent generations of stars are more and more chemically enriched because they're made from the pollution, polluted gas from yep. the previous generation. Yeah. Okay, cool. So... We know that globular clusters are old, but they're not purely hydrogen and helium. Yeah. Their atmospheres have other elements. So the gas that they formed out of must have been enriched by a previous generation of stars. Mm -hmm. Now, one of, the, one of the cool things is that you measure, so 150 globular clusters, you go out and you measure their, their content of, Elements. How much? How much elements do they have? And astronomers call this metallicity. <laughs> it's so, another one to. Yeah. Actually, so, I don't. I don't mind that one. That one's fine. Yeah. So, so I could not be bothered with the complexities of chemistry. If you're bigger than helium, you're a metal. Done. That's done. Right. So every element heavier than helium, we call a metal. And so metallicity tells you what's the amount of elements created in stars as opposed to elements created in the Big Bang. And there's something with globular clusters called the metallicity floor. All globular clusters that we measure have an enrichment above a minimum amount. Okay. So this is telling us something about where these globular clusters formed, where and when, right? Mm -hmm. They must have formed in an environment where gas had been polluted. Mm -hmm. And that environment can't be any old environment in the universe. If you take a really small galaxy and you take the first generation of stars, okay, mm -hmm. that, as you mentioned, they, they can be big stars and they can explode and they can drive all the gas out, right? So a little bit of dark matter um, has a very small gravitational pull. Mm -hmm. Supernova goes off, all the gas gets hit, it gets flung out. Mm -hmm. okay? So the globular clusters that we see formed from pre-enriched gas and that must be in an environment that can hold on to pre-enriched gas. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. So almost getting to Phoenix. <laughs> We're nearly there. Nearly there. So we measured the chemistry of the stars in Phoenix. Now, 
Phoenix is 67,000 light years away. We can't measure the chemistry of every star because those, most of the stars are too faint for us to get reliable data from. We look at the giant stars, the red giant stars. These are stars, masses a bit more than the sun, um, which have swollen up to these immense sizes. They're very bright. Mm -hmm. Bright things are easier to see. Mm -hmm. We measure its chemistry. It is below the chemistry of all the other globular clusters. And not just by a little bit, it's significantly below. Okay, so mm -hmm. the progenitor, which was a globular cluster, was unlike any of the globular clusters that currently remain. Okay, its chemistry was too poor. Okay, so hang on then. Why do you think, how do you know it was a globular cluster that you're pulling apart then? Because of the, the two key bits of evidence. Number one, the velocity dispersion. How, how the stars are zipping amongst themselves. So if you look at how an object um, gets strung out. So firstly, here's an object. Yep. Stars are buzzing around. Yep. They've got characteristic velocities. In globular clusters, it's a couple of kilometers per second. In uh, dwarf galaxies, it might be 10 kilometers per second because they've got dark matter to hold yeah. them. So they can buzz around a bit more. Turns out when you turn these things into a stream, that buzzing around in this sort of direction, that is a memory of what it was buzzing around like before. Okay. So in Phoenix, it's buzzing around by a kilometer per second or so. Yeah. Number two, what does the distribution of elements in the stars look like? In a dwarf galaxy where you can have multiple populations of stars being yeah. born at any particular time, you get something called a spread in metallicity. Some stars, uh, have some chemical elements, ha others have a lot, because there's lots of things going on all the yeah. time. A globular cluster tends to have a single population of stars made once. Yeah. They don't like, it's slightly more complicated. There can be further uh, episodes of star formation, but let's not complicate things. Generally, you create a population of stars and uh, they're all basically the same age, made from the same stuff. And if, if any, of, any, of our, any of our viewer, uh, has done a <laughs> has done a class in um, astronomy at high school at university, I should say. You're often given the color magnitude diagram of a globular cluster because it's a single aged thing and it's very easy to see all of the features. Okay. Yep. So Phoenix right. Phoenix looks like a globular cluster. Yeah, we didn't just throw this together. We thought about it. Yeah, of course. I was just wondering what the steps were. It seems like you've got something in the metallicity cellar. Correct. Below the metallicity floor. Yeah. Right. Right. So, so, so what does it tell us? What does it tell us? Well, what we think it tells us is that um, when our Milky Way has been forming in the early stages, things came raining in. And the question is, was it a, a rain of the same things all the time? Or was the initial rain in of material different to the future rain in of material? Mm -hmm. And the kind of picture that we think is going on is that, uh, that maybe there was an earlier epoch of, you know, you can imagine that things came in earlier on which were more uh, deficient in elements because they were formed out of stuff that was deficient in elements. They inhabited the halo. Mm -hmm. uh, other stuff kept raining in. The stuff that fell in first of all was the stuff that's orbited the longest that gets you know, more readily destroyed by the galactic tides, right? The gra gravitational pull of the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So there might have been more of these metal poor globular clusters early on, mm -hmm. but they've been ground down by the gravity of the Milky Way. Right. And what we're seeing here is Phoenix is being essentially the last of its kind. Right. right? So it is eventually going to disappear. Um, but yeah, it's, it, we think it's telling us something about processes going on in the galaxy um, before the current stuff basically made its way in and got established. Right. That's why this field of yours is called Galactic Archaeology. Galactic Archaeology. That's a great name because it, it sounds amazing. And it is actually quite accurate. You are really sort of trying to dig up the past of what happened in the Milky Way. Absolutely. And... It, you know, we, uh, we've looked at Phoenix. That's what the first stream that we've published now, but we have got 
a whole bunch of them in the bag and we think there's going to be some more interesting results about this entire field of galactic archaeology coming along soon. Outstanding. We'll stay tuned. So you've got a globular cluster, which is, it's in, it's in the metallicity attic. It's under the metallicity floor. Uh, you tend to have cellars under floors. Attics in the roof. <laughs> I, I, I might edit that later. I might not. <laughs> yeah. Let me. It's, it's like, it's like it's that song. The... It's like that song by Pharrell Williams, right? Because I'm happy like a room without a roof. Rooms don't have roofs. They have ceilings. <laughs> <laughs> yeah.